This is the Star Barista podcast, covering global cafe culture. Hello, this is Brian Jones for Starbarista.com. Today I'm speaking to Scott Hain about his book, The World of the Paris Cafe, uh, subtitled Sociability Among the French Working Class, 1789 to 1914. Dr. Hain is a native of, of the San Francisco Bay Area, where he currently teaches at Holy Names University. He re- received his BA from the University of California at Berkeley in 1976 and went on to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he earned an MA and PhD. His academic work has always been concerned with sociability and urban life in all its myriad forms. Hi, Scott. Thanks for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks so much, Brian. Can you tell me a little bit about how you became interested in cafe life and in cafe life in in Paris specifically? I started my uh, graduate career in the mid-70s after all the struggles and events of the 1960s and at a time when history was radically changing. I had begun my graduate work hoping to work on Jean-Jacques Rousseau and notions of imagination and community, in essence sociability, in the great philosopher's work. But when I arrived in graduate school, I realized and found that people were doing extraordinarily fascinating things with what was known as social history. One of the great questions was, how do you link the mentality of a society to its sociability, to its daily life? And the cafe seemed an ideal place. In, in your book, The World of the Paris Café, you investigate what the working class café reveals about sociability in 19th century Paris. Um, you write, cafés were a vital venue, a third place. And what do you mean by, by a third place? I take that term from Ray Oldenburg, who wrote a book entitled The Great Good Place, talking about how quote-unquote third places, bars, taverns, restaurants, basically are a third place outside of the home, if you will, the first place, and the workplace, the second place. And Oldenburg argues that all human beings need a balance in their lives between work, family life, and a broader sociability, including friends, neighbors, workmates. And so I found this term very good to get at the three, if you will, component parts of daily life and the life of the cafe. Now, in in relation to urban life for the French working class, why did they in particular need this in in Paris? 19th century Paris had an absolutely stupendous increase in population, basically doubling, tripling, almost quadrupling by the end of the 19th century. By the early 20th century, over three million people in Paris. On the eve of the French Revolution, maybe 600,000. The number of cafes, however, increased even more dramatically, from about 4,000 at the time of the French Revolution in 1789 to at one point during the 1880s when there were over 45,000 cafes in Paris. And a big reason for this was the dense overcrowding of the working class areas, the fact that they didn't have much housing really sort of forced the working class into cafes. These places had luxuries that many workers had never known before, either in Paris or in the countryside where they grew up. So you had a lot of people coming from the countryside into Paris. Yes. What role did the cafe have in for those particular people? What Was it filling a void for those people, That something that they had in their villages that they didn't have in Paris? In many ways, they had more in the cafe than they usually had in their villages, where they often might sweep in the same room as their animals, where there might be a dusty old tavern at most in their villages. They would come to cafe, mirrors, marble top tables, tapestries, even in working class areas. These cafes would be a magnificent draw and seem to be almost palaces next to the hovels they'd grown up in. How did the cafe fit into work, into family life, and neighborhood life? I discovered that 23% of the marriages, the civil marriages in Paris, roughly from 1860 to 1900, had at least one witness in the marriage contract who was a cafe owner. So you had 
a lot of cafe owners intimately tied into their clientele. About one half of that number were witnesses to baptisms or to deaths. The point being that cafe owners were there when people got married, when they had children, when they died. They really were an integral part of a neighborhood, especially for the working class, who were largely transient. Here was a place where they could really put down roots since they often moved from apartment to apartment. From reading your book, it seems like a, a cafe was a, a Parisian cafe was a very different place to what we think of as a, of a cafe in sort of an English-speaking country where you go to have a cup of coffee. Can you describe the scene in, in a typical working-class Parisian cafe? After the French Revolution, the guild distinctions between a wine merchant and a coffee shop were abolished. Before the French Revolution, wine merchants catering to the lower classes usually didn't have newspapers. They couldn't sell coffee with the French Revolution and the abolition of the guilds. Ordinary coffee houses suddenly took on the functions of food, wine, and wine shops often became centers of coffee drinking and newspaper reading. Now, people often did drink coffee in these establishments, but often it was laced with alcohol. By the end of the century, a coffee with Calvados was very popular, especially in the morning. So here was a way to sort of combine alertness with a certain sustenance, because many people believed that alcohol made you stronger and more fit to work in manual labor. Um, what, what kind of people owned and, and ran the, the cafes? It started out as a, a cross-section of the Parisian and the French population, the immigrant population. At the start of the 19th century, there were a lot of uh, people from Burgundy and other wine-producing regions who then became cafe owners in Paris. By the end of the century, the people of the Auvergne, the Auvergnat as they're known, became the dominant members of the cafe owner. The Auvergnat basically come from the mountainous south-central region of France. If you will, they are somewhat like the Scots in that they are considered strong and thrifty. And they took to cafe owning with great relish by the end of the 19th century. Roughly 60-70% of the cafe owners were Auvergnat. Now you refer to cafe owners as social entrepreneurs. Um, what does that mean? It means, in essence, that they often were at the very center of the animation of their neighborhood. Often, too, they would have uh, parties, if you will, for people who had birthdays or for workers after they got a new job. They were also the usual venue to celebrate the 14th of July, Bastille Day. That was usually considered the holiday of the cafe owner. The Marchand event. And what, what were the celebrations like in the cafes of, of uh, Bastille Day? What were the Bastille Days? A lot of drinking, toasting, dancing. These were all integral to cafe life. And in fact, they often had illustrated journals with basically the Marchand event and his cannons for the 14th, meaning not guns, but shot glasses were often known as cannons, hence the play on word between a cannon and a cannon, same in French as it is in English. So in all these ways, cafe owners looked upon their role as really animating a neighborhood. Of course, this was extremely hard and taxing work, especially at a time when most cafes stayed open almost all the time. Not so much 24 hours a day as seven days a week. Curfew, uh, closing hour would often be midnight or a bit later as we get into the early 20th century. Often it would begin at about 5 or 6 in the morning. Another thing that you wrote was that leisure could, um, could pattern work as much as work pattern leisure. It seems like the cafe played, well, as we've discussed, a, it was an important part of the, the day of a worker. They would often stop off before work, during work, and after work. Why did cafes play such an important role in the workday? Because they were so ubiquitous across Paris. By the 1880s, there's 
45,000 cafes. They're found not only in neighborhoods, but also in industrial and artisanal areas. So you didn't have to walk usually more than a few paces before you came to a cafe. What people would often do in artisanal production or in building and metal trades is do some work, go to the cafe while things were being casted or completed. The cafe being so close to the work sites allowed people to take time off whenever they wanted. Bosses and entrepreneurs were often beside themselves with rage because people would basically set their own patterns of work rather than following their own, uh, that is, the entrepreneur's schedule. So it was basically sort of a way that the workers could gain a little bit of control over yes, their own work day? most definitely. And it's interesting, too, that often strikes when they would break out would often have as an informal headquarters a cafe around the uh, factory or the workshop. Now, workers used to go to certain cafes. Was the same true for their bosses? Did they have their own cafes? Basically, each group within Paris had its own cafes. For the most part, cafes in the 19th century were not a great meeting place that cut across classes, unlike, let's say, going to the horse races or going to the 14th of July, when the whole society would go out in force. Cafes basically catered to neighborhoods and to work groups and to regional groups or ethnic groups even, let's say Italians, who were a big group within the French society at the end of the 19th century, rather than something that really had cross-class sociability. In many ways, that probably happens more today in France and in Paris than it did in the 19th century. The various classes and affinity groups of Paris usually socialized among themselves. Bringing this up to today, does working class cafe life still exist in Paris? Not very much because the working class, as it was defined in the 19th, even through the, the 1970s, is largely dying in France as it is in most industrial nations. Now you still see people in their blue overalls, something that was ubiquitous after World War II, much more rare now. But often workers will go in at lunch or during breaks to cafes, and in a sense, they will sort of recreate working class cafe sociability. But as Paris has increasingly become a middle class city, as fewer and fewer workers live in Paris, there are fewer and fewer true working class cafes. Also, the various immigrant groups to France have transformed cafe life and you get a, a hybrid now of cafes that are part French and part Middle Eastern, North African, Latin American. So what you have today is a phenomenal space. The cafe remains a space where people come together, interact, and literally create culture. Now you briefly mentioned you're working on another book. It's about the 1930s and 1940s. Like uh, I basically, in this next book, move from the Popular Front, which saw the apogee in the number of cafes, the Popular Front, in essence, being a time when the center and the left in the late 30s joined to fight fascism. In the World War II period, cafes are a key point and part of the resistance. This, of course, is the age of Sartre, de Beauvoir, Camus, and the great existentialist cafes of Saint-Germain-de-Prés. And then the tragic decline of the cafe after World War II. And how about, how about during Nazi occupation? What, what role did the cafes play then? They were a vital center of resistance, but I should also note that collaborationist groups often use them to mount their own demonstrations and mobilization drives. Naturally, many of the elite institutions were taken over by the Nazis and used for their own purposes. But I've also found that the very same cafe at the very same moment could have members of the resistance and members of the Wehrmacht, members of the Gestapo, eating and drinking in these establishments at the same time. And this is what I think makes these places so fascinating.
Now, I, I remember you, you told me a little bit about some of the research you're doing for this, and you're doing some research at the BBC archives. The BBC was very interested in the impact of its broadcasts on the French population, and they often basically got information by talking to people in cafes. Also, it's remarkable how often people listen to BBC broadcasts in cafes, even though that was prohibited and, in theory, subject to repression. But that didn't always happen. And also what you see is how do you get, if you will, public opinion data when a nation is occupied, often going into small corner cafes when nobody is really around and just talking with a few locals was one of the best ways to do it. Now, I remember you telling me about letters that they have in the archives at, at the BBC. Often what would happen is the BBC would encourage people in France to write them letters talking about what they had seen and heard, giving them a sense of the climate of public opinion in France. And often these letters cite cafe sociability as a, an index into public opinion. Have these letters revealed anything to you in particular? I think the sense in which so many people listen to so many radio broadcasts in cafes, seemingly oblivious to police spies or the Gestapo or the Vichy police swooping down on them. But I think in part, too, the occupying forces realized you had to give people a certain amount of space. And one place for that was the cafe. Scott Hain, thank you very much for, uh, for, ta for talking to me today. Thank you very much, Brian. It's been a wonderful interview. To hear more podcasts about global cafe culture, visit www.starbarista.com. Thank you.